No terceiro painel desta Advocatos Summit Lisboa, mais um espaço de debate com as convidadas Ana Sacoto, administradora do Banco Empresas Montepio, e Claire Bright, fundadora do Centro de Conhecimento Nova Business Human Rights and Environment da Nova School of Law. Um debate focado no tema financiamento sustentável, novos desenvolvimentos. A moderação fica a cargo de Raquel Azevedo, sócia de mercado de capitais bancário e financeiro da PLMJ. Bom dia. Antes de mais, queria agradecer à Advocados do Summit por esta iniciativa e por nos ter convidado para vir debater estes temas tão atuais. Uh, e por ser atual e estar na agenda de todos nós e na agenda global, vamos debater hoje uh, o financiamento sustentável. Um, o setor financeiro tem-se deparado com, com muitas transformações e, e a última delas, agora recentemente, deve-se ao ESG e a forma de acomodar esta nova preocupação. E uh, eu tenho comigo a Claire Bright e a Ana Sacoto, já, já apresentadas, e sem mais delongas, acho que podemos começar. Uh, obrigada às duas. Uh, we'll continue in English uh, because I think it will facilitate the conversation between uh, the three of us. Um, thank you both. Uh, it is an honor to have you here. Um, Anna, maybe I, I'll, start, uh, I'll start with you. Um, um, what recent efforts have you been witnessing in this area, uh, in the private sector, in order to promote sustainable, sustainable business? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with the both of you. Uh, well, I think that the first thing to notice is that uh, sustainability in the, is already embedded in the company's uh, DNA, uh, in their business strategies, is more often embedded in this, uh, in this approach of, of the sector, of the private sector, that is then to finance uh, financial institutions are to finance now. So this perception leads to, to, to the conclusion that this uh, sustainability is uh, now looked as an opportunity more than cost saving yeah. or, uh, or a PR tool, for instance, which is uh, something that is uh, very much uh, noticed. Uh, it is no longer uh, looked as such, but more than opportunities. Uh, to launch new products, to um, expand to new markets, etc. And so uh, the sustainability is there in companies. And the uh, financial sector cannot be indifferent to this tendency. No? We need to be aware of where the market is, where the companies are, what they need, what are the needs. Um, of course, there are still uh, some challenges because we have the so-called greenwashing, mm -hmm. uh, there is lack of information um, uh, that uh, give us a more systematic approach to, to understand exactly uh, the market trends or where th the companies are uh, going to and so we can follow their uh, financing needs, uh, especially in small uh, companies and businesses where they're less uh, that there is lack of information actually and also you see that uh, the companies have different frameworks for disclosure and these difficult again the quality of the data that we have that you mm -hmm. despite these uh, these um, these challenges of course uh, we can say that um, if in the beginning of the century um, sustainable finance was a niche now it is there and every banks and investors look at ESG as an opportunity uh, to incorporate these, um, the, the ESG um, concerns and considerations in their investment strategies or in their uh, risk approach. And, and so this is for um, market, uh, so to credit risk uh, management, mm -hmm. to product development, um, and um, and even and actually we see then then uh, the the market it itself um, creates new instruments to address the sustainable needs. So I would say that market demands um, more awareness to sustainability lead to a better uh, sustainable finance by the private sector. Uh, to give you some examples, we have 
seen um, more in other markets still, but uh, green deposits uh, that allow companies to invest um, to invest in uh, in deposits uh, connected to or destined to uh, sustainable projects. Uh, you have uh, in, in Portugal, for instance, recent examples of the green mortgage, where you have credit uh, to buy or to refurbish or to construct a property uh, that is then where the pricing is linked to the, the to the to the efficiency mm -hmm. of the property the in terms of energy mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. So I could give you a lot of examples, but I think this is these are the the, the message. This is the message, so sustainable finance is in the private sector trying to accommodate and to go uh, to attend the needs of the market and uh, more project. Is it a bit both ways? In you know, one sense, it tries to accommodate the needs and on the other sense, also to incentivize these type of projects, do you think? Yes, in the ways? sense that you, if you have a project, a sustainable project um, that allows the, 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 the financial mm -hmm. or the investor if we, to, to, to not to limit to banks, but if you have a sustainable project that can, deals, uh, can deal with uh, ESG impacts uh, mm -hmm. more uh, appropriate than others, of course, this will uh, help uh, the, the financing cost for you to yeah, be... Yeah, the pricing is following as well that trend, right? Not... Uh, not yet. You don't have... <laughs> Uh, exactly, um, well, you don't have yet a pattern, I would say, mm -hmm. in Portugal. If we look in other countries, maybe yes, uh, which are more developed in terms of, uh, yeah. of sustainable finance, uh, especially major banks that have specific strategies for that, etc. But yes, the tendency or the trend is that the, the, the price will align with, uh, with the ESG factors incorporated in projects because this w would allow uh, better risk perception. Yeah. For the for the investor, and so uh, they they would adjust the pricing accordingly. Yes. Would you like a comment? Sure. Um, so I know you were speaking about sustainability and sustainable. When we speak about sustainable business conduct, um, I think it's also important to sort of define what it is we are talking about mm -hmm. because it refers to a lot of things. Um, but um, one element that is crucial is um, human rights. And we see that when we look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, for instance, if we look at the preamble, it states that the 17 goals uh, and the 169 targets seek to realize the human rights of all. So if we want sustainable business practices, we have to have practices that are respectful of human rights. And uh, 11 years ago, the UN Human Rights Council uh, unanimously endorsed the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights which were the first um, instrument of a type. It's a, it's a soft law instrument. It doesn't impose legally binding obligations, but it is um, today the global standard in uh, responsible business conduct, sustainable business conduct, and in business and human rights and ESGs more generally. The UN guiding principles affirm that companies have a responsibility to respect human rights and that to discharge, to fulfill that responsibility, mm -hmm. they have to put in place measures, policies, in particular human rights due diligence process, which is a process enabling them to identify the adverse impact that they can have on human rights and then to address them once they have identified them. Now, when we look at corporate practices, and I was saying that now we have a lot of companies that have this sort of processes in place, and we see some leading companies, but the uptake still remains limited. When we, um, we did our study for the European Commission mm -hmm. on uh, due diligence requirements through the supply chain, we did a market study to understand what were the current corporate practices in this respect. And we found that in Europe, about one in one third of companies have human rights or environmental corporate uh, due diligence practices in place. And for the majority of those, it's actually limited to first year suppliers, which is in itself quite problematic because often you will find the most severe impact further down the chain. Mm -hmm. um, in Portugal, the situation is even worse. The first um, 
uh, annual uh, survey on responsible business conduct showed that it's about one in five companies uh, that have this type of processes in place. And Anna, you were speaking of SMEs earlier, and what we see in these studies is that um, it's even harder for SMEs, so even we find even lower numbers of SMEs having these sort of processes in place. Now, thinking about the impact of sustainable finance on that, what we do see is that the companies that do have human rights due diligence processes in place, the main incentives for those companies to have such processes in place are um, of three types in particular. The first one is a reputational pr uh, pressure, mm -hmm. so basically making, making sure that they don't damage their reputation through being associated to adverse human rights impact. The second one is a pressure by consumers, but the third one is a pressure by investors. And here we see that um, the investor, the financial world in general, have an important, are already playing an important mm -hmm. role, but have an even more important role to play in uh, fostering these responsible, sustainable, mm -hmm. concrete practices. So you think that um, when we talk about sustainable finance, people still focus more on the environmental part of sustainability and less on those matters? Absolutely. When we look at the ESG, the S, the social, which is the human rights, is all often called the weakest pillar. Yeah. This is where the most efforts needs to be done. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we all have with that perspective. Um, and Anna, you were talking about how these policies nowadays are already within the, um, the companies themselves and do you think investors as well, they, they consider uh, sustainability as important for their portfolios to have this type of investments in their portfolios that can help with uh, risk mitigation, etc. How do you see the investor side? Yes, definitely. You see that, um, again, um, <clears throat> making um, a, a better framework of the concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, sustainable finance, in the end, is incorporating the ESG considerations into credit risk and investment uh, making decision process. So, uh, and in, in terms, in the context of the risk, uh, of the risk uh, assessment, Yes, uh, to the extent that uh, investors incorporate ESG considerations in their uh, risk models, they will better uh, achieve because lesser risk is perceived as uh, a better investment mm -hmm. in the end. So, so yes, I would say that investors are incorporating this in their strategies yeah. uh, and in, uh, in frameworks uh, to, to to give all the methodology, Claire already spoke about due diligence, environmental due diligence or social due diligence is a very important um, topic in terms of, uh, of uh, credit risk management, for instance, for the investors. And so, yes, if you incorporate this in, uh, in, uh, in your methodology and in your policies, uh, the perception is that indeed ESG investment has uh, lesser risk and so it's more uh, welcome to investors. But it's not only about risk management, I would say, because um, as also Claire noted, uh, when you look about um, to sustainable investments, uh, investors also foster for better uh, returns, mm -hmm. of course, because it's in the end it's all about returns. Um, and also to influence uh, the, to in some cases to use their investments also to uh, to lead to a positive impact in terms of ESG uh, through uh, the selection of the companies that uh, uh, that are in the portfolios and so in the end we may say that um, ESG investments and uh, at, at current at current uh, moment in in the market are uh, leading to or are envisaging a greener portfolio also because uh, the diversification of the risk is also trying to accommodate and to incorporate these ESG strategies in the, in the risk management. Mm -hmm. And also, Claire already noted also uh, one topic, which is reputation. Mm -hmm. um, we know that uh, the market um, uh, calls for a new lens in terms of uh, to compare the investors and also the financial providers. For instance, it is very much noted that the millennials uh, are yeah. very sensitive to 
uh, to, to the investment uh, in, uh, in sustainable projects and so on. So if the financial entity, the bank, if I may speak about banks, um, present uh, products that incorporate already the ESG uh, principles, uh, this will also will, um, benefit the reputation of the, of the entity towards the market. <coughs> so, <coughs> Sorry. so you think not, well, on one side the investor, on the other side the client, they, they all nowadays look, look into that and would prefer uh, an institution, a financial institution in this case, that would incorporate those values and would have a green or a sustainable policy when investing and financing at the company. Right? That's what yes, it is not exclusive mm -hmm. because in reality, I think that um, the banks are still adapting to that. Yeah. Uh, to, to, but but in, at the end, what is, uh, and uh, for instance, the mortgage, the green mortgage that I spoke mm -hmm. about um, a few minutes ago, uh, are an example of that. So if you have this type of product, uh, maybe investors or clients in this case will um, yeah, choose to mm -hmm. to make their uh, their mortgage loan with you rather than with a bank that does not have, incorporate yeah. already these uh, these principles. So that's yes. that's the point. Yeah, yeah. So so I take from from your words that you have been seeing a greater number and volume of transactions in green blue uh, projects. We yes. didn't talk about blue yet, but I would like to yeah. go there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the data um, of the first uh, half of 2021 really show uh, an upward trend uh, in the in the green finance, uh, especially green finance, so green loans, green bonds, mm -hmm. with green loans um, around um, 820 billion euros for the first semester of the last year. Uh, we perceive, in terms of our own experience when dealing with, uh, with the clients, yes, we perceive there is a more appetite for, uh, for green projects mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are more green, green projects to finance. More still on the uh, renewable energy sectors, but also already challenging the traditional industries, the, those that are more mm -hmm. capital consuming or more harmless to, to environment. Uh, that are being so challenged in transitioning to, to a greener to way a greener of exactly mm -hmm. um, so this is this is at least in Portugal is still beginning but uh, but we see already not only the well as you know uh, Portuguese companies the big ones have already mm -hmm. yeah. issued like uh, 6.6 uh, billion green bonds and with great success exactly demand yeah exactly mm -hmm. so so yes uh, those big companies have uh, have already uh, given the, the first step I would say but for the the SMEs mm -hmm. we see a tendency of trying to to present projects and and uh, financing um, financial institutions to trying to to also not only on initial financing but uh, and direct investment but also in refinancing uh, we have seen uh, we have seen also so all the projects that are being refinanced now and they are being refinanced with a more ESG approach on the blue uh, on the blue side of the investment we, we don't yet see uh, many projects coming to at on least the to the banking side, sector on the credit side right? on the credit side exactly yeah. Um, and we question ourselves why, because uh, we have uh, Portugal as a coastline yeah. that goes uh, all along the Atlantic you, Ocean. Are the banks ready to take on the, that type of projects that still are in an early stage? Is it um, more the field of well, private equity as we this see is more, now? That's, uh, that was what I was going to say. I see this more in the beginning uh, for maybe uh, private equity funds to, to, to finance this mm -hmm. and to invest in, this, uh, in these projects. Since they are still in the, in the startup phase and, uh, and so the business plan, um, the, 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 the... And the risk that you take. Sorry? And the risk. And the risk, uh, the perception of the risk, etc., cetera, is, is probably more challenging, I would put this, uh, this, uh, this way, more challenging to banks to already finance these projects. And then you have also an issue maybe 
on the size of the transactions of the of because smaller uh, fisheries products for instance uh, projects for instance or investigation for for ind projects um, sometimes they are uh, sl um, little in terms yeah. small in terms of size uh, to attract or to really um, need for a financing uh, from a bank with different conditions rather than a direct investment from a private yes. equity that grows with that uh, project so it's it's different yeah and i suppose you uh, you would have in any way to adapt a bit your criteria, your risk uh, policies, etc. And maybe it is not still the time when it makes sense to do that uh, because the projects are too small and uh, in yes, a very uh, early stage. But. And 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 we need to understand. I'm not a credit risk expert. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, we have our own S we are CRO, lawyer, so. so I hope he's not hearing me now. But. Uh, I would say that um, uh, we are still on the green. I would say that yeah. we are still on the green step because, again, as we said before, with all the lack of information the, uh, and all the regulations that you have there, um, to to also incorporate in in banks uh, credit analysis. risk models yeah. and policies, it takes some time to to do something that at the end can systematically apply to every type of, of, <laughs> of business because we can't forget that um, companies, each company uh, faces their own uh, challenges. So they have different risks to manage. Uh, they have different, uh, they are probably in different, um, in different moments of their life, of their life cycle that then presents different, different challenges and to accommodate all of these so you cannot have a standard that just puts a label and says yeah. it's blue or it's green or it's sustainable uh, without uh, a, a really good perception of, of, uh, of the project, of the company. And again, as Claire said before, due diligence exercise, etc., cetera, is a, is a key piece of our uh, credit rescission process. So yes, I would say that, so focusing more to, to go back to your question yeah. on green projects, not so many on blue mm -hmm. ones yeah. still. What we also see as, um, as, a, as a trend is sustainable linked um, debt, which sustainable linked uh, allows the company to use the proceeds of the loan or of the mm -hmm. bond issue uh, to its corporate purposes, not to uh, assign to a specific green project, for instance. And so it's not project specific, it's, it's for not corporate project. purposes, but what's the link then? The difference is that then the pricing of the, and the, of the, of the, of the loan or of the bond, the coupon for instance, mm -hmm. is linked to, to sustainable KPIs that are set at the beginning of the, of the loan or of the mm -hmm. issue. And this uh, contributes to the awareness of the companies because when you identify your KPIs, that you want to achieve uh, to get to get a, a better ESG performance, you are already in a in an ESG environment, yeah. which is different than just corporate general purpose uh, as uh, as yeah. the market was before. So That's yes. maybe a, a, an interesting way to start on the SME. Exactly, right? exactly. To give the first steps and more flexibility at the end, in the beginning of the of the process of your adaptation mm -hmm. to ESG. Yes. Okay, that's good. Okay, and Claire, going back to human rights, we are <laughs> always skipping to the to the green. <laughs> going back to the directive on corporate sustainability, what do you think uh, we could develop more in the EU in terms of laws and regulations applicable to foster human rights compliance? Well, do we have enough, <laughs> or? Well, at the moment, maybe it's, it's important to sort of take a step yeah. back to see where, where we are at and where we came from. And with a proposed directive that you're mentioning, um, so basically the proposed directive builds on uh, the report I mentioned earlier that mm -hmm. I called for the European Commission, where we looked at the problem analysis, we looked at the, the issues of the corporate, the, 
basically the regulatory gap in relation to adverse human rights and environmental impacts of um, corporations, and what could be done from a regulatory mm -hmm. level. And so on that basis, we proposed four regulatory options that were based on what already existed, so the current uh, legislation that already exists in various countries, starting with uh, reporting regulations you mentioned earlier, so regulations that require uh, companies or financial institutions to report on certain mm -hmm. ESG issues, and we have those at the European level, but we also have those in certain countries like in the UK, in Australia, California in particular and others. Um, and then we also looked at other types of legislation which go beyond mere reporting to actually require entities, private entities, corporations to exercise due diligence as we have defined it earlier. And um, so we, on the basis of what existed, we proposed these four regulatory options going from the statute quo, so no regulatory change, to the adoption of new voluntary guidelines, the adoption of new regulatory, uh, reporting regulation that would go beyond the EU non-financial reporting directive, and the adoption of uh, uh, the fourth option was the adoption of a regulation that would impose legal obligations for companies to exercise human rights and environmental due diligence. And uh, we carried out um, extensive state mm -hmm. stakeholder consultations, uh, and that told us that the the, the option that was preferred across the board, including by companies themselves, or the majority of them, was actually the fourth option. So having um, corporate due diligence obligations in relation to human rights and, env and the environment as well. Um, why is that? Well, first of all, because that was perceived as the option that would have the greatest potential to yield positive uh, social and environmental mm -hmm. impact for people on the planet. <coughs> but also what was interesting is that companies saw that it would actually benefit business. And in fact, we had 70% of the companies that answered our survey that thought it would be beneficial for business um, for three reasons in particular. First of all, because it would level the playing field. So all those mm -hmm. companies that are already doing a lot, they want the other ones to also be held by the same standards. Then um, the second was the difficulty, and Anna was alluding to that earlier, we have a lot of regulations and different standards in different countries, and that's a very difficult and yep. challenging environment for companies to operate in. So the idea of having one unified standard at the European level rather than fragmented standards at Euro uh, national level was also something that was seen um, very beneficial. And the third, which is linked, is increasing legal certainty by having a clear, um, defined uh, obligations and, and, uh, and guidelines accompanying it. Now, so that uh, consultations basically led to uh, the proposal which was released on the 23rd of February, mm -hmm. and which basically, um, so it's just a proposed directive at mm -hmm. the moment, but basically the, um, what it in includes um, is obligations for uh, companies uh, in scope to exercise uh, human rights and environmental due diligence in relation to their own activities and throughout their global value chain. And these companies also include financial institutions mm -hmm. that will need to exercise due diligence prior um, to uh, providing uh, the services, the financial services uh, that they provide. Um, interestingly, it has a very wide scope of application whereby um, it will apply to large European companies as well as mid-cap companies that operate in certain sectors which are defined as high-risk sectors and we can basically group them in three categories which are textile, agriculture and fisheries and um, minerals. Mm -hmm. But it also applies to uh, non, so the so-called third part, third country companies, so non-European companies that do, that have significant operations uh, in the EU, which um, is basically evaluated in terms of turnover in the EU. So a very broad scope of application. And um, there has been a number of criticism, especially from civil society, to the fact that this is limited to large companies. And as we were discussing, mm -hmm. there's also a lot of work to be done with small and medium companies. But 
interestingly, what we do see is that the small and medium companies will also be in scope yeah. indirectly. Because of the value scope, the value chain, no? Exactly, mm -hmm. because if you ask large companies to do their due diligence yeah. in their operations, but also in relation to the operation of their established business relationship, then necessarily the small and medium enterprises that are in these value chains will also be required by um, larger companies mm -hmm. in scope to do their due diligence. So we have um, here a, a, a regulation with also strong enforcement mechanisms through both a public regulator that will need to be nominated by each country um, and also a civil liability provision in, in, in case of harm. So to come back to your question, I think here we have uh, quite a a, a lot, lot to do. Of, <laughs> quite a lot to do, and that regulation, which is most likely going to be adopted because already the European Parliament um, showed very strong support with the mm -hmm. resolution that it adopted last year for a, a regulation in that respect. And the Council of the European Union, uh, currently pres presided by France, also showed very strong support. So it's very likely that it will be. Uh, adopted. adopted soon and then we'll have to transpose it and that will take a while as we know for sure <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you well and um, as you were saying about well support of international institutions on these matters uh, I would like to understand how you think that COP26 will have an impact it was about financial uh, sustainable finance do you think that will also have an impact or is just a public statement and well, we hope so, or at least the market hopes so, no? because uh, there are a lot of international initiatives then yeah. every day, I think, uh, today we have different initiatives taking place at UN and so on, so I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's expected to have an impact. Uh, well, the, the outcome of the, of the COP26 mm -hmm. was uh, the Glasgow Climate yeah. Pact, and uh, where there was uh, uh, a significant awareness that much more money needs to be uh, driven uh, to uh, climate adaptation, yeah. to support development of countries, etc. So it's at the end, it, it intensified the urgency of, of, the, of the targets of the, of the Paris Agreement to reach uh, net zero carbon by 2015, actually. Um, a few weeks ago, I heard about some countries that are trying also to anticipate this this, uh, this deadline uh, because of the current uh, yeah. the current events sure. and uh, and and the war uh, taking place uh, that um, puts uh, more uh, more in evidence mm -hmm. the dependence now of yeah. the of the energy uh, that uh, that we need, we all need to to try to be more more green also. And so um, I think yes, uh, so to the extent again there is a more awareness of the need to put money into, into climate change, this will necessarily lead banks to, uh, to, to try to give and, and one of the messages, uh, uh, specific message of the Glasgow Climate Pact is exactly urge the developed countries uh, and financial institutions and investors to drive uh, and to enhance mm -hmm. the financing and, and also to uh, invest uh, investigation and development that can um, add to the achievement of, these, uh, of, the, of the Paris mm -hmm. Agreement targets. And in particular, you have an initiative that, in my opinion, um, expresses the, the commitment of the financial sector with, uh, with, as an outcome of the COP26, which is the Glasgow Alliance of, uh, for Net Zero, uh, Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, um, uh, which uh, puts together more than 450 uh, institutions in, from 45 different countries and uh, this is aimed again to, to achieve and to put in place all the measures uh, and to contribute to a compromise to the, to the finance of, uh, of uh, a net, uh, net zero carbon mm -hmm. economy. So yes, the outcome is there. Let's see what uh, what will result in practice. This is a very recent. This is from yeah, last year. Recent, yeah. And the, in the meantime, lots of things uh, have happened in the in the in the few, in the in the in the economy and in, in the, the society itself. in the world itself. <laughs> so so yes, but there is an expectation that uh, this will be one more piece of change. More because, than good intentions. Uh, <laughs> yes, I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. And. 
and with this urge to, to do something about ESG and become greener, etc., um, what, what strategies have you been uh, seeing developing in, in the private sector around that? Well, um, from my perception, I investors and banks in particular um, still use the well-known ESG strategies such as uh, screening strategies, negative screening in particular. Uh, that basically um, lead to, so when you have a, a screening strategy, what you basically do is that you screen, you have predetermined ESG criteria that you use to rule companies mm -hmm. in or out from a, from a certain um, classification and then for financing purposes or for invest in investing purposes. So. The negative screening at the end will lead to exclude okay. companies that operate in a specific sector, for instance, oil and gas, mm -hmm. or uh, that are dedicated to uh, certain products like uh, the typical weapons, uh, tobacco, gambling, uh, or as uh, Claire was noting uh, before, uh, the corporate um, practices uh, like uh, child labor or animal testing, for instance. Uh, and so screening strategies in the negative sense yeah. lead you to this. The positive uh, strategies of screening in, in the reverse will lead you to select uh, companies that score better in terms of ESG performance when compared to their peers. So you can have a mm -hmm. best in class approach or simply those that perform better than others, uh, the peers. Uh, in respect of certain ESG uh, perspective. Then also uh, we still st uh, use uh, uh, the thematic uh, strategies where you have the so-called project, the green project or uh, an environmental project um, or a social project and then with this thematic approach you select the projects or the companies to invest in. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. A more recent trend that is still giving the first steps, but I think it's, uh, it's uh, critical to the development of the market and also links with, uh, with all the, the, um, the, the, the necessary relationship, a stronger relationship between the companies and the financial market is the so-called ESG engagement strategies. Because these strategies, the difference is that you don't have just the predetermined criteria that you apply to, to make the selection, mm -hmm. but indeed this involves an engagement with the companies, a discussion of the ESG issues with the corporate borrowers um, to contribute then to their uh, better performance. Is more interactive, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as being more interactive, it will hopefully also um, contribute to, to a better um, credit uh, making decision process because of the differences that we have debated before, the, the lot, because as you don't have many data available or if these are not so give you certainty of, of exactly the performance of the company, then it's better if you have an interaction with them. And this actually is a win-win situation if you look because companies in these in this, uh, type of strategies at the end will also benefit from the knowledge because one of the... Yeah, they win a coach. Yeah, those, yeah, because one of the issues <laughs> is that many companies and especially small and, and, uh, and mid, mid companies are not still uh, prepared sometimes to um, to deal with ESG risks now, to deal with uh, with their own challenges, and with this support of the financing sector, namely corporate finance uh, support, in uh, helping them to construe the business model, uh, to identify the material risks to them, etc. Mm -hmm. Even if this is not the initial purpose of the strategy, at the end, companies will will think yeah. well. Maybe I need to incorporate this in my in my corporate strategy, or did I actually sort that my my risk my my primary uh, ESG risk was this and is not this other, or do I have an opportunity, for instance, the social um, the S of mm -hmm. the ESG uh, that we are talking about, which is not 
not so much uh, yet um, in, in a priority sometimes, maybe you yeah. can you can go, uh, you, you can perceive, perceive that you have there an opportunity to finance and uh, to finance in better conditions that in the end it's it's what uh, it's what improving is improving uh, your policies yeah that yes. makes sense well if the banks have the resources to do that <laughs> they will have to adapt we try to I be guess. closer to <laughs> I, i'm not supposed to be advertising my bank but yes we try to be closer to our clients yeah. to to help them yes in that well we, we don't have much time i'm sorry um but i wanted to ask a last question because as we are 100 uh, percent female panel here. Uh, how do you see this gender diversity uh, has been evolving? Is it still just complying with, with the current law and uh, regulations or is it more than that now? Well, I don't know. Uh, in my opinion, I, I would like to hear also Claire because uh, to, we, we are even in this, in this, in this case. So, I would say that um, the business case, what you see is that the business case for diversity is, is, is there, okay? I don't think it's still a compliance matter mm -hmm. or a PR tool. Um, it is much more embedded already also in, in the companies because uh, it is perceived that uh, diversity and, uh, and also uh, inclusion of, of other of other uh, social topics in the in the in the corporate governance and in the human resources of company policies of the companies uh, enhances the, the the performance of the company. So, uh, being able a leader that can mm -hmm. deal with different uh, different um, uh, opinions and and um, it it will be much more probably much more uh, able to to deal with uh, with uh, with also performance on different and efficiency because uh, i think i strongly believe that men and women are complementary in in the in the in the sense in in the workplace and uh, and in uh, in developing the corporate strategies of course there is a long way to go still um, especially on top executive which have more visibility. You still see um, extremes. So, um, for instance, you see that um, Nordic countries, some of them already at least have one woman in in, in, uh, in decision making mm -hmm. uh, making places. But uh, while others that are like Germany, for instance, or or Japan or Brazil, have none. Mm -hmm. So. I think Portugal in that sense is, I would say, in between yeah. the, the extremes because I read a lot about of this topic and I think we are in between the, the extremes now. Um, maybe some recent events like the, the COVID, the pandemics, did not help to, the, to keeping this, this trend no, of diversity. You think of it diverse... was uh, detrimental to this, uh, this situation? It is seen as detrimental. At the, at, at the pandemic phase, mm -hmm. it, this at least is my, mm -hmm. my, my personal opinion. I think it, in the pandemic phase, it was detrimental because typically uh, women were called home to, to take care of the, of the children and domestic affairs. And, uh, and so they, they, they moved back a little, a little uh, and didn't have the, that visibility. But on the other hand, I think that the outcome of this pandemic uh, like um, working from home uh, or networking uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, still uh, well these diversity issues are more mitigated because uh, you see that um, women can do things well the same way the same way as men and uh, and actually I think that some men now uh, <laughs> prefer to have the women job um, a, a last note that I, I will I will leave here to to the audience also uh, and for you is that uh, there is an interesting study that I that I crossed um, with uh, from McKinsey mm -hmm. that is called diversity wins it's a series yeah. of three three studies that they started in 2015 uh, with the question uh, why diversity matters 
after all. And then they, in 2020, May, they, they published the third uh, study of that series uh, where the conclusion, yes, uh, is diversity wins. So at the end, I think it's, uh, again, it's like sustainable finance. We have some job to do, some long way to, to go, but uh, diversity is there. And, uh, and I think it will, it will come. I would prefer it naturally because yeah. I think it's natural. But if necessary, some regulation, and there is already in the, at the level of the EU regulation on, on, uh, and communications from the EU on diversity, uh, if there is uh, the need for some regulatory effort to, to push for diversity, well, we, we are welcome to, 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 to have that also. I don't know, Claire. I, I completely, know, Claire? yes, I completely agree uh, with, with Anna, what you said. And what we see also at the level of the states as well, uh, there are some comparative studies that actually show that the states that have the most women in power and in the legislature are the states that are doing the least worse, maybe I will put it like that in terms of gender gap. So there is a co correlation between the corporate governance or at the level of the state, the, the model, and the actual outcome. And we talk about diversity, it's a very important topic, but also it is very linked to that gender gap, uh, pay gap. And here we see improvements for mm -hmm. sure, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. At the European level, it's estimated there's still 14% difference between men and women for equal work. So we're not yet at equal pay for equal work. And in fact, the European Commission did uh, publish a proposed directive uh, in 2020 specifically on that topic. So we do see um, some regulations coming. But it's a very important topic. And maybe on just one final note, uh, because it sort of wraps up all the things that we were saying, I think when we talk about ESGs and sustainability, what is needed is really a holistic approach and you can't take just one of the mm -hmm. pillars and ignore the, 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 the other two. We, here we've been talking about the E, the S and the G and really this needs to be taken holistically. Thank you. That's a good conclusion for our talk. Thank you both and obrigado por terem ficado connosco. Obrigado. Many thanks. <laughs>